Well, it turns out Twitter wasn't the only company that was following government marching orders when it came to COVID content. Newly obtained files from Facebook show that Facebook was also, or I guess the company now known as Meta, was also uh, following the government's marching orders and doing exactly what the government wanted and what the CDC wanted when it came to COVID content. With us now is senior editor at Reason and also my former co-host, uh, who's still a host at Hills Rising, Robbie Suave. Robbie, welcome to the show. Great to see you, Kim. I've missed you. Uh, I've missed you. <laughs> uh, so tell tell us, first of all, how did you get these emails? These Facebook so this is files? Yes, this is part of the lawsuit that the state of Missouri has filed um, against the Biden administration. They're arguing that the pressure that various government agencies put on social media companies in its totality violates uh, the First Amendment. And there's a legal group representing them or helping them called the New Civil Liberties Alliance. And, and I got them from them. So really, anyone could have could have done that. They're not the uh, the emails are part of the lawsuit. I think I'm the first person to get like all of them and and kind of present them in this manner. But uh, right. I was pretty blown away by them, and I, I think people really deserve to see what was inside them. What would you say was the most the 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 thing that shocked you the most with these files? It's I think what shocked me the most is just the sheer number of them, the sheer volume. I mean, in over the course of 2021, the CDC is talking to Facebook almost every single day. Facebook, every claim that is going viral about COVID, about vaccines, about masks, about whether they should be authorized for children, that is all being vetted by the CDC. The uh, Facebook meta is emailing the CDC and saying, hey, this is what we're seeing on the platform. What do you think about these claims? Do you think they're wrong? And then they're asking, do you think they're harmful? And then finally, they're asking, do you think this could cause vaccine reluctance? And the CDC mm -hmm. says, well, yeah, anything could cause vaccine reluctance, uh, which is a kind of uh, very serious implication, I think. Yeah, so it wasn't just based on fact or what was actual medical misinformation. It was also based on, well, will people mm -hmm. not take the vaccine if they know about this? And that is something that they censored. I think that is probably the most damning thing that I found also when reading your thread um, and then also reading your article on Reason was that, wow, I mean, for them to even censor actual truthful information, but just saying this is just, we just don't want really this amplified people if they knew about this and maybe this wouldn't be something that they'd want to take. And they didn't quite say it like that, but that is absolutely what they were implying, it seems like. So some of the things that I saw from your emails um, that were released here, I think one of them, so I, you do have this list, you, you kind of showcase this list of all of the things that the Facebook was asking CDC, you know, help us figure out whether or not these are, you know, what we should be uh, flagging, right? And what's interesting on here, some of them, okay, you know, they're talking about uh, vaccines having, causing magnetism or right. vax or face masks contain harmful nano worms or something, right? But then some of them are things like vaccines cause a, 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 a cytokine storm and vaccine cause Bell's palsy. And they even said in the email, right, well, this is actually, the WHO says this is inconclusive. So what do you want us to do about it? I thought that yeah, was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and there's some stuff about um, menstrual cycles. There's some stuff about, and, and then about, you know, whether it should be uh, authorized for kids. Look, right, a lot of this information, a lot of things being flagged, I don't agree with. I think they're wrong. But there are debates around, uh, you know, legitimate medical experts disagree about whether the trade-offs are worth it, particularly for young people. Um, there's debates about, about how effective masks were and have been at various stages of the pandemic. I, I mean, the the Fauci himself has changed his mind or appeared to change his mind about that several times. Right. So my point would be, I think these are these are legitimate debates and conversations. And Facebook was basically asking the CDC, here are all the points where you would like us to shut off this conversation. Right. And I think maybe you agree with that, but I think people ought to know about that. And, and it, it goes far beyond what I even guessed at. Obviously, from watching the Twitter files, we started to get a hint that wow, there is so much more conversation, communication between the government and social media companies than that we were aware of. And, and so this is kind of in that vein. Right. And I think then the big question would be, why did Facebook behave this way? Or why did Meta behave this way 
for Instagram and for Facebook. Were they coerced? Was there any evidence in these emails that they were feeling in any way, shape or form coerced by the government? Or were they really just whatever the government says we just want to do and they were happy to do it because they are a private company and that is the mm -hmm. argument that uh, often people make. Uh, libertarians, even like yourself, would say, well, private companies can do whatever they want to do, right? Mm -hmm. So were they really operating on their own in doing this or was there some coercion, do you think, from what you saw? Right. The tone of the emails is very friendly, is very uh, meta, is eager to please. They refer to the CDC as their colleagues. Um, I think it's misguided, but that was the tone of the emails. But we have to keep in mind that while this was going on in private, you know, in, in July of 2021, Joe Biden on television said Facebook is killing people. And then one of his senior, senior comms people on MSNBC said, all this misinformation, if Facebook and social media companies don't do more, we're going to need to uh, enact punitive regulation. So that right. is what the lawmakers are saying publicly. It's an open question. Does that influence just how nice, how compliant Facebook ends up being with the CDC in private? My guess would be yes. Can't prove that, but that would be right. what I suspect. And I, so I think there will be a strong legal case to make that given the explicit threats coming from the White House, other Democratic politicians, and then the amount of communication going on behind closed doors, all of that together is enough to be a kind of violation of, of, a, of a company's right. I, I think Facebook should have the right to make their own policies, even policies I don't agree with. Did Facebook think it had that right? Was Facebook operating in a sense where they feel like they can do what they think is best? Or did they think that they are going to get uh, you know, obliterated by the federal government uh, if they went a different way? That's what I suspect. Yeah, and I, I, I'm with that same suspicion. I think that they were dragged in. I mean, we watched these guys get dragged in to congressional hearings, asked, I mean, especially after 2016 when Trump won, it was, how could you have let this happen? I mean, that was really what they kept asking these executives over and over, Zuckerberg, and we saw Jack Dorsey brought in there and the heads of Google. And, you know, they were all just paraded in and asked over and over, how could they possibly have let Donald Trump become president mm -hmm. of the United States? And it was always under the, you know, with the undertone of, well, the Russians, right? How could you have let the Russians do this? And then, of course, they were implying that the Russians then somehow propagandized America in order to um, sway the election in favor of Donald Trump, right? That was like the entire connect the dots premise, which is really sort of election denial, which we're not allowed to do, right? Yeah. But they're allowed to well, deny the election. And that's what the Twitter files have really ultimately shown. I mean, I so the beginning, the first batch was about Hunter Biden, and that really was the the, the worst one from Twitter's perspective, where they really did something that was foolish and, and they really freely chose that choice and then doubled down on it. But in a lot of the subsequent Twitter files dispatches, I've actually seen pushback from Twitter when they got emails from the FBI saying, oh, you, your, your, pro, your platform has tons of Russian disinformation. You need to take this down. We've actually seen emails now where they said, wait a minute, we looked at this and you're actually not right about this. These are not fake accounts or they've, they've been seen by a trivial number of people. There was pushback. But what happened is the FBI committed to that so much. It sent so many messages and then said, you know what, if you're not taking this seriously enough, maybe maybe other media companies would like to know about how Twitter is failing its, you know, its, its civic duty to make our election safe. And we're going to have Democratic politicians saying that democracy is dead in this country because of the actions you've taken. And what happens is eventually Twitter caves. Eventually, right. they are worn down by this amount of pressure. And that is a really scary kind of thing. Like, it was not, I, I'm sorry, it was just not their first impulse was not to say, oh, you're right, it's all Russian. We got to take it all down. That happened after a long period of time. And the Twitter files have really opened our eyes to that. Well, I mean, I think Zuckerberg in particular was much more friendly to Democrats than maybe even Jack Dorsey or any of these other CEOs. I mean, he was openly very much um, really pro-Democrats, Democrat policies. Isn't there, I just, I, it, maybe you know more than I do on this. I'm just trying to remember, was there something recently about Zuckerberg spending with Democrats that was like controversial in the news? Did you see something like that? I feel well, like- given I feel like he's given money. Well, I mean, the funniest thing about uh, Facebook and Zuckerberg and Democrats is that one of his co-founders of Facebook, Chris, uh, I believe his name is Chris Hughes. He's the one that he later tried to own the New Republic briefly. But he, he co-founded Facebook with Zuckerberg. He left Facebook during the Obama campaign. He left to go work 
for the Obama campaign. He took everything he knew about Facebook and used all of that to help build a social media presence. I mean, you know, this is back, this is back over a decade ago. This is, you know, before the kind of modern how you use social media for politics. And he was celebrated for for doing all this stuff to promote Barack Obama on Facebook and on social media. And he totally had like the inside track knowledge of that. Um, and that was celebrated by the media. That was like hailed as like, wow, good for him. Look at all, look at how smart that was. And then when Republicans use whatever powers they've gotten on social media to like have viral successes, it's, you know, it's like talked about as the end of the world. I, I just think that's funny. So you being a libertarian, we've had many conversations about how you just think the government shouldn't be controlling anything. And you and I definitely disagree about um, about these companies being regulated. You don't think there should be any regulation of these social media companies. And I do think that there should be some regulation to protect our free speech on these platforms. So I'm curious, after you see all these Facebook files, after you see these emails, and how complicit Facebook was with the government, and how they then censored users, do you think there should be some sort of regulation on these social media companies if they're claiming to be social media, if they're claiming to be platforms for people to post their opinions, and then they remove those posts, label these people as misinformation. Do you think there should be some regulation on this, Robbie? Give well, I've never bit. said there should be no regulation. <laughs> I think that, you know, they have to take down uh, terrorist content and underage pornography, you know, all that stuff. That's all fine. Illegal um, stuff, I would, sure. Okay. Yes. I would say that our opinions would be best protected on social media if the government was constrained from making demands. I would say we need rules that prevent agents at the FBI and the CDC from doing outreach, from saying, from asking, from making requests to take down accounts in the same way that like government employees are not allowed to um, to campaign in, to use like their office to for political purposes of a campaign. The Hatch Act pro prohibits that. We need some kind of thing like that to stop this because the social media companies, I think, felt pressured to do it. I, I mean, you know, if you wanted to try to craft a regulation that makes the social media companies be more reflect, uh, respectful of our free speech rights, I think it's going to get, I think that itself might actually end up being not constitutional because in some ways you're then doing the thing you don't want the government to do. It, it's, it looks to me like very dicey. And the most straightforward way to correct a lot of this stuff would just be to like reform the CDC and the FBI and, and other agencies. Could be wrong about that, but I don't think, you know, I don't, we have to trust if you, if you regulate them, then they're always going to be subject to whoever, whatever regulatory that authority is. And well, the FBI and the CDC are regulatory authorities. They're going along with regulatory authorities right now. So, you know, if we had like a czar of free speech who had the amount of principles that you and I have, maybe then I would sleep easy. But I assume the person who's going to be in that position is going to feel the way about you and I that the mainstream media and the current elites and regulatory authorities feel about right. us, which is that we're like the most evil spreaders of disinformation in the world. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, and I, I actually, when I think about these files, they almost make your case a little bit for you, you know, with Twitter and Facebook and what they're exposing is that government meddling, government intrusion is the real root of this problem. It isn't necessarily the social media companies themselves so much as the government meddling in. Although with Facebook, because of these files show that Facebook was like, tell us what to do. What should we do? Oh, is this or is this not? Whereas Twitter, like you mentioned, said, oh, come on, like, oh, right. I guess we'll do this. I guess, you know, we'll go along with this. So there was definitely a different seeming um, sentiment between the two companies and the interaction with the government. But yeah, I, maybe, but then there would need to be some sort of mechanism to prevent the government from meddling in places. You know, this wasn't like a government agency necessarily that was set up, like a big bureaucratic agency that was set up to regulate social media. And now it's causing, you know, this big government issue. It's that they were doing it. There's no, there's nothing stopping them really from doing it. It's like, why, what would stop government officials from yeah. continuing to say to a business, hey, we don't like how you're operating. We want you to do I mean, something it would be different. Easier, it would be easier to pass a law saying that federal employees cannot 
contact social media companies and ask them to take down content. That would be easier than passing a law that said social media companies have to leave up content because social media companies are private companies. So if you did that, someone could argue you're actually violating the First Amendment because private companies do have a right to take down content because they're private entities and the First Amendment stops the government from telling private companies what to do. But federal employees, government employees, we could we could have rules that that stopped in the same way if you had a business, you could say, well, my employee, I mean, the federal government employees are our employees in a sense. So if you ran a business, you could say your employees, you know, don't, here's how you're supposed to behave on social media or in, in the emails. It'd be more like that. Yeah, right. Like maybe some sort of regulation, like you can't use your power as a government official to yeah. scare and <laughs> scare people and say it would be a shame if something happened to your business you know and so exactly. we, we want you to do exactly. we want you to do xyz thing because or else and that's really what it seems like the government did but i still do think there needs to be some regulation of these social media companies where they are t i i do think that there should be the regulation that they do need to keep posts up and even if they don't like it if you're putting yourself out there as a business saying my business model is allowing people to come and post what they're thinking and what they're feeling, and that is protected under Section 230, then I think you have to adhere to that. And that is something that they need to be regulated and forced into. Like either that or you become a publisher. If you're gonna start curating content, then you have to be, you deem yourself a publisher and put yourself out there that way. I mean, the issue, obviously we could take away, if we change the Section 230 thing, but the, which we could do, but the problem is if they were, then that would make them liable the same way like a book publisher is liable for, you know, if, if my book publisher, if there's something libelous, defamatory in the book, you could sue the book publisher. You can't sue Facebook if I say something defamatory on Facebook because of Section 230. But you see what the issue is there, and I don't know why Republicans want to get rid of this so badly. If you get rid of Section 230 and make it so that you could sue Facebook for defamatory things I say on Facebook, What's Facebook going to do? They're going to like have to vet all content ahead of time. They're, it, it's going to be wildly more censorship. They're going right. to they're not going to let you say anything it, like it's right. going to be a thousand times worse. Or like only verified people will be able to speak only people like this would actually benefit media elites so much. There's, like it's not surprising to me at all that like Elizabeth Warren style Democratic political figures love this idea and the New York Times loves it, loves this idea. Um, I, I don't, for the life of me, understand why many Republicans have kind of embraced it, too. It seems like the quickest way to kill off all yeah. contrarian conversation. I, I agree with you. Media. I agree with you 100 percent. It only benefits those who want to control speech, because at that point, mm -hmm. then you would have to control your speech. You'd have to control it if you were a social media company. You would have no choice. You would be liable for anything anybody said. So the only option you would have is to start curating content and yeah, letting allowing those who you verify, who you know are not gonna cross any line, be the ones that are posting on the platform. And that's exactly why Democrats seem to want it is because they want to be yep. able to go and cherry pick which information is out there. But it is odd that Republicans wanna get rid of it. But from my sense, they wanna get rid of it because they're saying, um, well, you shouldn't have this protection if you're not going to adhere to it the way that it's meant. You know, so it's meant for you to be able to just leave posts up and not be liable. Well, if you're going to start curating content and becoming a publisher, then you shouldn't have Section 230 protection. So we're just going to take this away from you. But it's like that threat of taking it away. Like you said, it's like it, it is like it, it makes it worse. All you're doing is yeah. handing it over to the, the people yeah. who would love to just go and start curating and moderating content. So it doesn't make any sense at all. But. That's where we're at with this. I mean, hopefully, do you think, you know, and I'm interested about this with your your book, Tech Panic, and one thing that you've always been talking about is we shouldn't be so afraid of big of big tech and, and social media. And I'm one of those people that's been more alarmist about them. And you're like, oh, you know, there's not as much to be panicked about as you think. So when you see these files, though, do you, does that change your mind at all about social media, big tech? I would say, I mean, I'm, I'm, always worried about collusion between big powerful interests in the private sector in the corporate world and government and this is a good example of big tech and big government coming together to make some bad decisions the reason i always push back against kind of panic about tech in general is that you know i have to be honest about the fact that i think social media warts and all has been a, a really good development for a lot of people it's allowed me to have a lot more interesting conversations i i host a show on youtube i'm able to talk to you on an alternative competing platform that I think is great. And I, I think that will be a good development if many of the existing platforms face competition from 
uh, you know, entities that have different, maybe better values and see how that works out. But I just have to appreciate uh, how much actual speech and talking there is now because of social media. I don't want to go back to an era where like only the, the mainstream was allowed to be expressed because there were no alternative platforms. I mean, this is, again, despite the censorship and the bad decisions, this is the healthiest time for contrarian dialogue like ever, right? When was there ever, when was it ever this easy to start a channel or a publication and go viral and get traction for expressing ideas that the elites in the mainstream didn't want? Which is why they're so desperate to lock this down and stop this from happening. That's why their top goal is fighting disinformation. I mean, I, I'm sure you've been watching Davos. I watched the the uh, Brian Stelter's panel with all those people about disinformation, how they said disinformation, the central problem of our time, everything it, it flows from it. And the, the most, uh, the, the person on that panel who alarmed me the most was the publisher of the New York Times who basically said, you know, society is going to come to an end unless Facebook prioritizes the New York Times. Like that was his <laughs> viewpoint, that, that because you have access to non-elite sources of information, like the world doesn't function anymore. That's that's what they want to do, and they haven't been able to do it, and I, I think that's actually healthy for society. Yeah, well, uh, big tech to me does have way too much power, and I do think that they, they, even without the behest of the government, could potentially control society in a way that I think needs to be regulated. That's me, you know, so. <laughs> but uh, certainly there is a really alarming trend of this idea of needing to censor and, and clamp down on disinformation. And you're right, at the WEF, you know, in Davos, them talking about it like this is very scary because a lot of times that then becomes um, policy. And even the, the head of the European Commission, you know, she was out there saying, oh, yes, uh, you're going to start having laws in the United States against hate speech. And you're going to have, you know, and it's like, who gets to decide what that is? And so, and, and who decides what's misinformation? As we saw with these Facebook files that, they were claiming uh, heart inflammation and uh, and irregular periods and cytokine storms and even you know they were things that we now know do actually happen for some people. They were saying no, that's misinformation. We got to get rid of that, and that is very scary. So, um, well, yeah. good good job, Robbie, with getting these Facebook files out there. Really, really um, interesting, and I'm curious. You know, I'm sure we'll be seeing more of this type of stuff rolling out throughout time, just more people exposing the fact that there's, there was this very big concerted effort, it seems like, from the government to control the narratives for whatever their purpose in even controlling truth and censoring truth, like the lab leak theory, them saying, oh, mm -hmm. no, no, that's censoring that. Can't completely. talk about that. Can't. Yeah, now we can. But at that time, <laughs> absolutely could not. So wondering when we can talk about masking. Is that allowed yet? Are we allowed to talk about whether or not masks are effective <laughs> on YouTube? You are you allowed to talk about that there? Great. Right. What you're allowed to even say. I don't know. I guess I got to send a really polite uh, email to the CDC. Saying, can I please ask some questions about this policy, please? <laughs> yeah, because I think on I think on YouTube, you're still not allowed to question mask uh, mm. you know, <laughs> efficacy. Well, I think I, we still we haven't to. gotten our entire channel shut down again anytime recently. I remember when you were yeah. uh, you were uh, you and I were hosting with Ryan Grimm and uh, over that stu unbelievably stupid uh, accusation that we had done election misinformation just because we played a clip CPAC. of Trump saying something I didn't agree with, but we, it was just news. We're like, here, he said this. And they said we had, uh, we had spread election misinformation. It was crazy. That's, oh. that's big tech for you. See, Robbie, this is what yeah. I'm talking about. That that's big tech for you. Yeah. That needs to be regulated. All right, I've never said we don't have the right to complain about it. I, you, you know, I, I do my fair share of complaining about all the I know this is how you libertarians are you guys just complain compl you complain about it but then when it comes down to it it's like okay Rand Paul now what are we going to do about it Meh. Yeah. okay well, well we're going to hold back <laughs> the channel that's what we're going to do <laughs> all right Robbie thanks for being on Robbie is the senior editor over at Reason you can check out the the Facebook files there and also on his Twitter thread Robbie so good to see you thanks for good, being so here so good to see you Kim my pleasure thank you
I want to share with you a new product that I've been using and loving lately. It's called Field of Greens, and it's an amazing way to get all of your fruits and vegetables into your diet. It's a simple powder that you can mix into your drink or sprinkle it onto your food. And what makes Field of Greens different from other products is that it's made with real freeze-dried organic fruits and vegetables instead of extracts. And I know for me, it can be difficult to get all of my fruits and veggies in, especially when I'm doing something like intermittent fasting or two shakes a day in a sensible meal type diet. And with the new year, many of us are trying to get back on track with our health goals. That's where Field of Greens comes, comes in. It's a great way to get those vital nutrients, and that has helped me feel less hungry between meals. My body now has the nutrition it needs. So today I mixed mine into a chocolate protein shake. It gave it a delicious fruity taste like raspberry chocolate. So if you're interested in trying it out for yourself, head to Field of Greens website and use promo code KIM to get 15% off your first order. Give it a try and let me know what you think.